The default styling for links and for buttons is just not great. You can see here I don't even have a cursor for any of these buttons, only for the link itself. And then as I tab over to these, you just don't have a great focus state here. So what we're going to do is create our own defaults that we can adjust with a bunch of modern CSS. Here, if I uncomment all of this CSS in the code pen, you can see now instead we've got this nice effect both for hover, and then I've also got a nice effect when it comes to focus. See how that just kind of moves in and out and animates really nicely. On top of that, we've got a secondary button and all of this styling is done automatically for us. In fact, I've set this all up with templating so it's super easy to adjust. If I come over here and I adjust the hue of everything, let's change it to like a red color, you can see that not only do the primary buttons change, but the secondary buttons do as well. On top of that, I can change the size so that as the font size increases, all the borders, all the focus states, all of that just automatically respond to whatever the font size is of the button itself. And on top of all of that, we're gonna set it up so that dark mode works automatically as well. Hey, what's up? My name is Chris and welcome to Coding in Public. Let's go ahead and build out our own sample styles. And I've got just an open folder over here in VS Code and I'm gonna add a file here. Let's just call this index.html. And then I'll use some Emmet boilerplate here with this bang and enter and it will give me everything I need to get this up and running. Let's come over here, let's call this something like button defaults or something like that. And then I'm gonna use the extension live server to get up a dev server, so let me click this. Now you see over here on the right, I've got everything set up and ready to go. First thing we'll do is go ahead and add some HTML and then we'll worry about the CSS. So let's start with a container div. So this is just a div with a class of container. You can give this whatever you want, but that's what I'll use to style everything. And then I'll have an H1 here that says something like sample uh, buttons. And then below here, we're gonna have a container uh, flex like this. And again, this is just a class we're gonna style here in the CSS, but this will hold both links and buttons. Now it's important to note, first of all, before we get going too far, that links and buttons are semantically different. And it's important that you treat them differently. So here I've got a link tag itself. We're gonna point it to nothing, but this is different than a button tag. Let's call this something like uh, go to page, uh, whatever. All right, so it's gonna to go to a page. And that reminds us that link tags are meant for navigation. So that means you can use them to jump on a page to a different section of a page or to go to a different page entirely. You should not use them, however, for interactions. Let me go ahead and first of all, throw a class on here quickly, a BTN, because we're gonna style it like a button, even though it's a link in this case, because I'm trying to kind of call them to action to do something. Now there are strong opinions about whether buttons and links should ever look the exact same, but I think as long as you semantically know the difference, uh, then uh, personally, I'm comfortable styling links as buttons as long as the use case is clear from the semantic markup. So below here, we're gonna have instead of this link tag, we'll have a button. And again, I'm gonna give this a class of BTN, just like that. And we'll call this something like first CTA. If I save it over here, you can see that I've got a link. This is the default styling and I've got a button. Again, the default styling. Again, buttons are meant for more interactions on page. So things like a search uh, bar popping up or some kind of modal popping up. This is what a button is meant for. Let's go ahead and just duplicate this last one a couple of times. And here I'm gonna change a couple of things. First of all, let's go ahead and grab this CTA here and below, we're gonna say span. And inside here we'll say search because we're gonna use this for some kind of search field. Now I'm gonna go ahead and paste in an SVG. It's just a search icon. And I've grabbed this from hero icons. There's a couple of things I wanna point out. One is I've set a, a default width for how this will load in the browser. And then we can adjust this further with CSS. And then secondly, this works on inline SVGs, but if you add current color, this SVG will now pick up the color on the stroke property or whatever you set it on to match whatever the color of the text is in the button. So that's important so we don't have to style this separately. We can just style the button color and the stroke will automatically inherit that and pick that up. I notice here that I did not pull in the closing SVG tag for some reason, so let's grab that. And then what I'm gonna do is actually grab both of these things and we'll do the same down here. Let me just paste this in here. We're gonna add one more class and that will be our class of button secondary. We'll use this to style that button a little bit differently than our primary button. Let me come back up to the top here and let's do the same thing up here. So we'll do button secondary like that. All right, so that's all the markup we're gonna do. And you can see here, we've got a link, we've got a normal button, and then we've got two search buttons. And we wanna style these separately so that we know how this will respond, both in size and in position with the text next to it. All right, now just to make it a little simpler, let's go ahead and write all of our styles in line. And uh, I'll just do it right here in the, oh, right inside the opening body tag. Let's go ahead and start with some defaults here. So let's just set all the items to box sizing border box, 
padding and margin zero. Those are pretty basic resets. Next, let's do some resets for the button itself. So let's inherit the font, which will be all the font sizing, the property, the actual font family itself, all of that from the body. And then we'll set the border to none by default and a cursor or pointer so that we get that cursor as we hover over the button. Now, when it comes to actually theming all of this out, we've got some modern presets we're going to use, and we're going to set all of these things using custom CSS properties. Now, I'm not going to go into large detail about how to use all these. We'll just use them in practice. And then if you have questions, you can check out other videos I've done. So we're going to start with a couple of templating things. First of all, I'm going to have a CSS variable called hue. All of our colors are going to be in HSL, hue, saturation, and lightness. And by adjusting this hue, we can basically change the entire color scheme of our entire page. And this is a really nice way to use default CSS things like CSS variables to go ahead and adjust the page for light and dark mode and a bunch of other things. Secondly, I'm going to have a font size that will be set on the button itself. We'll start with it at 1.5 rem, but as you saw in the intro, we can adjust this and everything should adjust dynamically with it. And then finally, we'll have a transition speed. We'll use this for when people want to prefer reduced motion and they want that on. We can adjust this transition speed variable as we need to. Now, next, what I want to do is I want to add a light section here. What we're going to do is style out the light and then we'll style out the dark and then we will add some defaults. So that will by default start with a light mode and if somebody has their machine set to dark mode, we can adjust for that. So let me come in here and I'm just gonna paste these values in and then I'll talk you through them. There they are, let me go ahead and give us a little bit more room to kind of see what's going on here. We can see that what I've done is I've added things like background, text, accent, and secondary, and I set them all with this double dash to light. In other words, this would be for my light mode. What I've done is then pulled in the hue itself from up here, this is that hue variable. So it's pulling it in here, so I only have to change this once, and it will change it everywhere in my light mode and eventually also in my dark mode. Then for the saturation, I've just picked values that I think work well. So for light, I have a little bit more gray. For the text itself, slightly more uh, saturation. And then the actual accent, I want to be pretty vibrant. And then you'll see that I have this very, very light for the background, very dark for the text, and right in the middle for the accent. Now, I've done something a little bit different with the secondary, which is that I'm calculating the hue plus an additional 190. Now, with hue itself, it goes from 0 to 360, and then actually you can just add on additional numbers. So like 361 wraps back around to the beginning. So every 360 value points, it will basically restart the color wheel itself. So that means I can just add to this about half the color wheel or a little bit more, and you can change this or adjust it for whatever your needs are. And that will give me a color that should work fairly well with whatever my dominant accent color is. Again, you can adjust this to be more specific, but it's a nice starting point for a default, and that's really all I'm trying to do here. Secondly, let's go ahead and add a dark set as well. You can see I've done the exact same thing. The only difference here is that for my background in dark, I've made it a very dark color. For my text background, I've made it a light color. And then uh, for both of the accent and the secondary, I basically reduced it to be a little bit less intense as far as the saturation, and then also slightly adjusted the lightness of the color. Now we're not using these in anywhere yet, so let's go ahead and add some defaults. Everything is going to use this syntax of just background like this, and then they will point to a default value. I'm going to make the default for the site my light theme. Now in VS Code, you can just do a double dash like this, and it'll go ahead and kind of look up all of your custom variables. So I can just say light, start typing, and that's it, the BG light. Now if I drop this down one more, we can go ahead and adjust this out and this out for text. I go again, and we can adjust this for accent. I go one more time, and we can adjust this for secondary. Now these would be my defaults for all of these items. Now there's one more thing we want to add, which is to tell the browser to use default styling for light mode as my default. And what I'm going to do here is just say color scheme, just like this on the root, which is the same as the HTML essentially, and set this to light. Now we might also want to use this on dark mode. We haven't yet set this up anywhere though, so just to make sure we actually are getting it to behave as we expect, let's come in here and on our body set a background color here. And what I'm going to do now is select my background variable. Now you may have noticed up top, the way I wrote these HSL values, I actually did not wrap, wrap them in HSL. We're gonna use that to dynamically set alpha channels when we want to below, but in order to actually access any colors through this, that means I need to wrap my variable itself in HSL. So I'm gonna do that, HSL, and we're gonna call this background, just like that. And then I'll save this, let's copy it down, and then let's update just the color itself. Same thing here, except here we will change this to text. 
In other words, I'm wrapping this in HSL, and then those three values that I'm pulling in from up top are being dumped right into that normal function. So I've got that set and ready to go. Now what I want to do is, so that I can actually see what's going on here, is set up a default for my dark mode. So I can just say media, and in here say prefers color scheme, colon dark. So whenever that is the case, the user has that selected on their machine as their preference, I want to reset some things on the root. And all I want to do is take these defaults right here, and I'll just paste them in. And then I'll come up top here, and I'm just going to grab the lights and now point them to my dark, just like that. And again, color scheme I'm going to set to dark so that I'll have some nice defaults for my dark mode. If I come over here and I change my system to dark, everything then should update automatically. And if I had a scroll bar or other things that are dark mode enabled by the browser, as I were to scroll, those would now be dark mode because I've set the color scheme here to dark. And that tells the browser essentially to try to style things for dark mode in all the default things it uses. All right, so we've got a basic scheme set up that we can use. And as we adjust the color, everything should adjust with it. So let me go ahead, first of all, and change this back to light mode. And then let's go ahead and start styling out the body itself. And here, I really just need to add one more thing, which would be a font family. And we'll just use the system UI font. So that way it picks up the default for Mac OS or on your machine, perhaps for Windows. Now, everything again is inside of a div with a class of container. So let's go ahead and style that. And here, the important thing is I want it to take up the full height of the viewport. So we'll do 100% view height. And then I want this to be display of grid. And we'll give it a gap of 2 rem. This basically is going to separate this text here from this container that holds all these flex items. Now, you can see that's not quite spaced out how I want it to be because I want it to be right in the center. So let's say place items center. And then to push everything to the center, we'll say place content center. And then finally, let's add a little bit of padding all the way around of 1 rem. Now, all of our buttons live inside of another container with a class of container flex right here. So let's go ahead and set that up. So we'll say dot container flex like that. And then inside here, we'll do display a flex. We want this to flex wrap so those buttons wrap when they need to. And again, we'll set this to wrap. And I'll set a gap here of 2 rem, which is now supported in all modern browsers. And then I'll say place items center. That means both align item center and justify item center. And then to make sure everything stays central, no matter the size of the screen here, I'll say justify content of center as well. All right, so with those defaults set up, we're now ready to actually style our button. The button itself, whether it uses a link tag or a button tag, we actually want it to look very similar if I have this BTN class on it. So first of all, let's set the font size. And you might remember we have a variable up top that is my size variable right here. That means we can adjust that one value and everything with it should adjust. Now you may have noticed that on some of these variables, I have an underscore. I'd like to do that when it's kind of a controlling variable that's used for other variables all throughout the site. And that by adjusting those, it will basically dynamically adjust the page. So that's how I kind of distinguish those and lots of other people do that as well. Now, if we remember our buttons, some of them are just text and some of them have an icon as well. But let's go ahead and style it so that if there is an icon, it will always display the way we want. And if it, there is no icon, it's not going to hurt it. So we'll make it a flex container, so display a flex, and then we'll say align items center, and that will line everything up, up and down, and then let's also say justify content center, push everything left and right to the center of the button. Finally, once again, let's give this a little gap, and we'll say 0.5, and this is important here, EM. These M units are basically going to use the font size of the button to dynamically adjust according to whatever that font size is. That means this gap will adjust based on the size of the font, which is what we want. Now to think a little bit more about templating here, what we're gonna do is set up this BTN class to be our primary kind of default button. So I'm gonna just say background color here. And in this case, what I wanna do is have a color. And just like up above, I have to wrap this in HSL and we're gonna call this my accent like this. So it'll pick up my accent color as the primary to start with. And then I'll copy this down and change the color of the text. And here we want this to match the background, so BG. It looks ugly, but you can see now it's picked up those colors. So let's go ahead and give it a little bit more spacing. First of all, before we do that, I guess, though, let's remove that text decoration. It would only be on the link tags themselves, but it is there. So we want everything to look the same. So let me remove that. Next, then, let's add some padding. So once again, I want to use M units so that everything adjusts dynamically with the font size. So we'll say 0.4M and then how about 1.4M? And then let's go ahead and set up a border radius the same way. We're going to use those, uh, those M units as well. So 0.2M like that, and that way it will dynamically adjust with the font size. 
Now to visually make these stand off the page, I like to do just a really subtle box shadow. So let's go ahead and do that. Box shadow like this. I'm gonna go ahead and paste in now three different box shadows. We're gonna use these for all the buttons. So there we go, I've pasted it in. Let me show you what this is doing. I'll go ahead and save it first. You can see it dynamically generated over here. You see that nice, uh, just real subtle box shadow. And that's showing up because of this right here. So what I've done is I pushed it off using M units once again. So it's dynamic to the font size off to the right. And then I pushed it down, and now this is the blur around it, 0.9M. Now notice, because I have those HSL values like this where I can wrap them, that also means I can dynamically add alpha channels. That's what I mentioned at the beginning. In other words, I have a 30% opacity on this color, and I can just write it directly in here without having to set up like a custom variable just for that opacity. Now these two are a little bit curious, but basically what I've done is I want a ring around them like I showed you at the very beginning. And so I want the inner ring to be the same color as the background, and then the outer ring to have the same color, just with a little bit of opacity here on the button itself. That will happen only on the focus state, so we're not gonna see that quite yet, but I've hidden them by essentially putting them negatively underneath the button currently. And then I'll pull them out dynamically with a nice transition when we focus on them. Speaking of that transition, let's go ahead and add that in. So I'm going to say transition like this, and then down below, I'll go ahead and paste these in as well. Now I've added two of these. You see a box shadow, and we've set this with the transition speed variable that we had up top. And then I just have kind of a snappy cubic, cubic bezier curve that makes it a little bit more dynamic and interesting. Same thing on the background color. I've used the exact same uh, values. Now there are a few things we need to do left. First of all, we need to set up our secondary button color. Secondly, we need to worry about a couple of states, as in hover and focus. And then finally, we've got a few small quality of life improvements. Let's first of all work on that button secondary though. And all I have to do in here, because I've used this accent all throughout, I've used it on the box shadow, I've used it on the background color. All I have to do is actually update that variable value whenever I'm inside of this class button secondary. So I can just use the call it right here and say accent like this. And then this time what I'm gonna do is update it to point it to my var of secondary. If I do that and go ahead and save, you're gonna see that those automatically pick up that coloring. And it looks like, actually I kind of messed this up. This shouldn't be button secondary here. Uh, I want this to be right here. All right, perfect. That's what I want it to look like. Uh, but you can see that that picks up this color. And the nice thing is it even picks it up on the box shadow as well, all around that. So this has that slight yellow box shadow color all around. And that's really all it takes to set up that secondary button color. Now let's think about those focus and hover states. So maybe let's start with the hover. I'm gonna grab the button class itself, whether it's button or secondary doesn't too much matter. And then what I'm gonna do is use the where selector. This has zero specificity, so it's easy to overwrite later if I need to. But I'm gonna grab both the active uh, and the hover states. And then what I'll do is update the background color. Now again, because my button secondary has redefined what accent means in here, I can just continue to use my accent. And that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna come here with my accent. I'm gonna add here an opacity as well. We'll do 80% opacity. In other words, whenever I hover, I want this to change to 80% opacity. If I come over here, that's what happens. Same thing on this side. And again, it's gonna just use that dynamic color that I've updated right here for my button secondary. Now the next thing I wanna do is actually change the box shadow from being visible to invisible. So I want it to kind of shrink away to show that I'm hovering over it. So let's go ahead and just copy all of this right here. And I'm gonna paste this in just below. Now I actually don't wanna show the ring yet, so I'll just leave that where it is. But for all of these, I'm just gonna change these to zero, zero, and zero. So it's not gonna show at all, and that's what I want. So if I come over here now and hover, that whole box shadow should disappear. And you can see, especially once I pull off, it returns. All right, so that's our hover state. Let's now think about our focus state. So by default, we've got that nice, ugly blue color. So let's go ahead and grab the focus itself on all of these with the BTN class and focus. We'll say outline of none. Now, that's very dangerous because if I come in here now and tab, I'm actually focused here, but you can't see. I'm focused here, but you can't see here and here. So what we need to do is now add back in our own default focus states. If you ever take away this outline, you've got to replace it with something that's actually visible so that people can see what they focused on. So let's grab our BTN and we're gonna use the pseudo selector of focus visible. So whenever it's being tabbed to, all we're gonna do is update the box shadow. We're gonna grab all of this and change just one thing here. This here can be the same because I don't want any of that real uh, nice gradient on it when I focused on it but I do actually want this ring to show. What I'm gonna do is come inside here, remove these negatives like here, and we'll change this to a two and this to a four. 
And then the last thing I'll do is update this accent value here to something like 0.5. So let me save it and then show you what it looks like and talk you through it. So I'm going to come over here now and hit tab. And you can see I get this nice little animation where it pops up and shows itself on that button. Now what I've done here is this right here is this background color. It's that white color. And you can see that that's where it's at right there. And then on the outside of it is this lighter ring. That's the same color as the button, but a little bit opaque just to show that it's a focus state and not like part of the button or anything like that. And again, because this accent color is being dynamically changed on the button secondary, when I come over here, that suddenly takes on that nice opaque version of that yellowish color. So that's our two states we had to worry about, our hover and our focus. Now we've got finally just a few quality of life improvements. The first thing I wanna think about is the actual button itself. If I come back up top here, the first thing I wanna think about is the icon itself. If I come back up top here and adjust the size, let's go to something like 2.5 rem, you can see that all the fonts update, but this icon stays the exact same size. So we actually wanna use this size variable to update the size of that image or SVG. So let me come all the way back down to my button and just below the button itself, uh, I guess maybe below the button secondary too, let's grab the button and then we'll say inside of here. So with a space, we're saying anything inside of here. And we'll use where again, just to keep it as uh, unspecific as possible. There's an SVG or an image. What I wanna do is come in here and say that the width should be my var of size. And that way it should dynamically adjust. And if I save it there, you see that's what it does. Now, the other thing I wanna do is make sure that I can't actually click on either the spans or the icon. Because when I'm using JavaScript to capture the events on these buttons in particular, I wanna make sure that I'm only clicking the button and not these inner items. So what I'll do is come inside here and maybe let's copy this down. And we'll just add to this list here, uh, span. Now, what I'm gonna change this to now to say is pointer events of none. So I can't actually click on the icon itself, just on the button, it clicks right through those items, which is what I would want. Now, finally, you can see here, if I come into this focus state, uh, let's first of all, maybe change to dark mode just to see what that looks like. Okay, good, everything is still working properly. Uh, but if I come into this focus state, there is that nice animation and it's really nice if I like it, but if you don't like that kind of stuff and you prefer no motion or reduced motion, I wanna make sure I respect the user's settings and adjust for that. So let me first of all, open up the uh, console here, look at the elements. And if I hit Command Shift P, it allows me to run certain commands. So I'm gonna just search for reduce motion like that. There we go. And now if I come in here and I select it, still it all looks the exact same. So let's adjust for it with that enable. So let me come back up top here um, as our final thing, maybe just below this media query. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this down just so I don't have to type out media again. <laughs> Not that that's that hard but we're gonna say prefers reduced uh, motion. And then here, the keyword is reduce. So when somebody wants prefers reduced motion on as reduced, what I wanna do is inside the root, redefine my variable. And let's go ahead and grab that text right here. So transition speed, I just wanna redefine that. So if that's their preference, in the root itself, I wanna change this to something more like 100. If I save it, come over here, and then I select this. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I just destroyed all my color scheming. Wrong place. All right, let's come down here. This would be reduce like this. And then in here, here's where I wanna change that out, just like that, and we'll change this to 100. All right, now if I come over here and you can see with that prefers reduced motion on, it's just real quick and snappy, and that way it's just real light on the motion. Prefers reduced motion doesn't mean no motion, it means reduced motion. Now if I were to close this down, it'll actually remove that kind of temporary setting. And now we go right back to what we set it up as. Now again, because we set all these up with these three variables up top that influence the whole styling and speed of everything, I can adjust all this. So I could come in here and say something like zero to give me a red color and maybe change this to back down to 1.2 or something like that. And we can change this to 600. Now, if I save this, those should all adjust for me. And now I come in here and all the box shadows, the actual size of those rings, those are dynamically generated as well. So with a little bit of theming, you can set up something that's super dynamic, super adjustable, and all you're really doing is adjusting a couple of values up top. Let's change this back to something more reasonable so it's a little bit easier to see. And look at that, just nice styled buttons by default. And again, you can customize these further if you want to inside of any kind of classes, but it's a nice starting point, I think, for buttons. 
What else might you do to kind of improve the default button situation in most browsers? If you have suggestions of how I can improve this, let me know. I'll leave a link to the code pin in the description. But for now, I hope you enjoyed this and it was a big help to you. Well, thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Happy coding.